Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending on when you are watching this. This is going to be a um, walkthrough of the first lecture set for STAT 151 in the fall 2022 semester. If you haven't watched the uh, short welcome video, um, my name is Brian Franzak. I will be your instructor this semester. And um, throughout the semester, we will be using a combination of in-person and online uh, lectures to work our way through the course material. So this, of course, is the first online lecture corresponding to the first lecture set. And this particular lecture set will be relevant to the um, first assignment, first question from part A, and some other questions throughout the assignment. In this lecture set, we will discuss some introductory introductory definitions for the upcoming semester. We'll start with the general definition of statistics. Then we will talk about types of statistics. We will talk about the idea of population versus sample. This is a very important um, discussion that will repeat itself throughout the course. We will define observational studies and designed experiments and talk a little bit about the differences between the two. And then we will talk about the idea of simple random sampling, which is a way that we can collect a sample from a population, which is again, uh, an important concept that we will revisit throughout the semester. All right, so I usually start off my courses with this quote from W.A. Wallace. Statistics is a body of methods for making wise decisions in the face of uncertainty. Now, this particular quote is actually referring to the second of the two different definitions that we can use when we are trying to describe what statistics are or what statistics is. The most common interpretation of statistics is that it is or that they are facts. So you might think of them as some sort of numerical description of a particular phenomena or um, event that's occurred within your daily life. And it doesn't take a lot of effort to find different examples of statistics. I'm going to give five very basic ones on the next slide. But even if you consider um, an article that you read in your news feed or uh, perhaps a fact that was shared on social media, most often these are going to include some type of statistic that's describing uh, a particular population based off of um, some hopefully representative sample. And again, we'll revisit these ideas in a moment. So this would be the um, first definition of statistic. It's simply a raw fact or some numerical description of an event that's taking place within our daily lives. The second definition of statistics, and this is more relevant when you think about the quote that we read on the previous slide, is that it is a science of organizing and summarizing numerical or non-numerical information. And the second definition um, is one that we will focus on looking at examples of in the second half of the course, okay? So statistics in a nutshell can be raw data or facts, numerical facts, or it can be actual tools or techniques that we use to make statements about some larger collection of elements. So some population that we're interested in. And we're gonna see examples of this as we progress through the lecture set and through the course. All right, now going back to the first definition, which is that of statistics being just numerical facts, I have a uh, five different examples on slide number five. So for example, the internet has 5.03 billion users. This would be a very simple illustration of a statistic. Um, Canada's coastline accounts for 202,080 kilometers of the world's total 356,000 kilometers of ocean front. Stantec Tower in downtown Edmonton is 823 tall. This is a measurement of the height of the tower, a statistic. 
Um, Canada has between 7 and 9% of the world's renewable water supply. Again, this would be a measurement based off of some based off of estimates taken by you know, some sort of company that would study this sort of thing. And these are the values and actually the range of values that they have found to measure the uh, world's renewable water supply within our country. And um, we'll talk more about the idea of range and variation across statistics in lecture set two. And here's um, another statistic based off of um, the NHL. So Connor McDavid, captain of the Edmonton Oilers, has scored at a rate of 1.43 points per game in his career. So our goal as statisticians would be to calculate and interpret these values. There are two different sets of tools that we can utilize when we are trying to calculate and interpret. We can think of these tools as being descriptive or inferential, which brings us to our first set of key definitions um, for the class. Okay, so we're going to start the course off and mainly in lecture set number two, we're gonna talk about a whole different variety of descriptive statistical tools. Very simply, descriptive statistical tools are simply formula that we use to calculate a, um, well, they're, that we use to calculate one value from a set of collected values. So examples of these could be the formula to compute the mean, which is the same thing as an average, um, the tool to compute the median, the formula to compute the standard deviation. They're simply ways for us to take a collection of values and then get one summarizing number out of that collection. We can also um, think of graphical tools. So things like pie charts, bar charts, histograms, and box plots as belonging to our set of descriptive tools because they too provide us with an understanding of how the data that we are working with, so the collection of values that we are working with, um, behave. And in lecture set two, we will look at or how to build these types of plots, interpret these types of plots, construct these different values, and give interpretations of these different values. The second set of tools are the inferential tools. Now, inferential tools make use of the results from our descriptive tools. So most of the inferential tools that we are going to work with in STAT 151 take the descriptive values that we calculated and then use them in some um, setting to answer a question about a particular population based off of the result we get from the descriptive analysis. And again, this is going to be the focus of the second half of the course. So we will revisit this idea of inference in much more detail after the midterm. I have a few different illustrations of what an inferential tool could look like. So for example, hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. But again, we're gonna see these in much more detail later. In describing inferential statistics, I talked about this idea of a population in a sample. When we are making uh, an inferential statement, what we are trying to do is describe a larger collection of elements which is of interest to us, and we typically refer to this larger collection as a population, using a subset that we have taken from that population that we refer to as a sample. Now, to illustrate this idea, I like to use a very simple diagram. Okay, so you can imagine this rectangle here. Okay, as the population. So we're gonna label this rectangle population. So everything inside the rectangle is what we are interested in studying. Okay, so everything you can think of this rectangle as containing all the elements that we would be interested in making some statement about. The sample is simply a subset or a portion of this rectangle. So Let's say I draw a circle here. 
this circle could be the first sample from the population. Now we can actually sample repeatedly from a population. And every time we do that, if we are using proper sampling techniques, like simple random sampling, which we'll see a little bit later, we will get a different portion of the rectangle. But the key is that this portion is still contained within the rectangle. So perhaps we sample again, and we get another circle over here. Right, so we can think of this, or we could label this sample two. The key is that these samples have been collected using a proper sampling strategy, and the samples are within the rectangle. Why is it important that the samples are within the rectangle? Well, we can say that any sample that represents or is properly collected from the population is representative of the population. And the reason that we want our sample to be representative is because when we use it to make statements about the population, it gives us confidence that those statements are actually accurate and can be made about the population. Okay. So we can say here, samples one and two are representative samples because they were collected using a proper sampling strategy, okay? Right. And then we could also say, just for clear, um, for clarification further, samples one and two are composed of elements within the population of interest. Now, just for illustrative purposes, let's suppose that we had a third sample and this wasn't collected using a proper sampling technique. So maybe the third sample looks something like this. Right. So this is going to be sample three. Okay, so we can see here the issue that we're running into is that sample three also contains elements that are outside the population of interest. So this means that we could experience or we can't reliably use sample three to make a statement about the population because it's taking information from a portion or it's taking information from elements that are not of interest to us. So we might say that sample three is not representative because it doesn't contain uh, values strictly from the population of interest. Well, actually, I can state this better. So sample three is non-representative because it contains valid or elements outside the population of interest.
Okay. What we're going to do now is work through two simple illustrations to demonstrate how we can identify the population and how we can identify a sample within uh, uh, using descriptions of particular studies that are taking place. So in illustration number one, we have based off of 2018 estimates, there are approximately 445 million adult pink salmon in the North, North Pacific. Suppose 25 million salmon are caught, tagged, measured, and returned. We want to identify the population of interest and the sample in this particular case. All right, this is a fairly simple problem. The population is the larger collection of all elements that are of interest to us. So in this case, adult pink salmon in the North, North Pacific. The sample is the subset of those pink salmon that we are actually able to study. Okay, so here we would have the population is the 445 million adult pink salmon, and the sample is the 25 million adult thing, same, All right? And then just for clarification, the elements, I've used this term a few times now, the element is the particular unit that we are studying within the population. So the element in this example are the adult, or is each adult um, pink salmon. Okay, example two, university executives are interested in enhancing the learning experience of their undergraduate student population. Suppose a group of student representatives is, constructing, is constructed using two students from every program offered at the university. Okay, so this is not as direct an example as example one, but we can still determine the population, the sample, and then the element for uh, illustrative purposes using the description that's given here. All right, so first of all, what is it that we are interested in or what is it that the university executives are interested in? They want to enhance the learning experience of their undergraduate student population. So the population is actually all of the undergraduate students at the university of interest. Okay, so all undergraduate students at at university or at this university would be more appropriate. Okay, the sample is going to be the is going to be the full collection of the two students from every program. Okay, so okay, so our sample is going to be. For example, if there's 20 programs at the university, our sample is going to be comprised of 40 students. All right. Now, what is the element in this case? The element is just the individual undergraduate student. So an or a under 
graduate student. Okay. <clears throat> now that we have seen some examples of um, the definite, well, now that we've looked at the definition of the population, the definition of the sample, and we've seen some examples of identifying a population and a sample, we can return to the idea of descriptive tools versus inferential tools. And within a particular um, problem, we can identify whether or not the study or the problem of interest would fall under the category of being a descriptive problem or an inferential problem. The key difference between descriptive and inferential statistics is that descriptive statistics focus on making um, the statements about the sample directly. So given a sample of individuals, we will calculate some descriptive values or we will build some descriptive plots and we will interpret those plots in the context of the sample alone. Inferential tools will take the results from the sample and try and use them to make a statement about the larger collection of population elements. So descriptive statistics is a within sample set of tools and only within the sample are those tools applied and interpreted. Whereas inferential statistics are used to take our sample values and make a statement about the larger population of values. Right. Okay. On slide 10, we will look at some illustrations. And what we are trying to do here is simply determine, is it an inferential study or is it a descriptive study? In example one, we have a ledger study surveyed Albertans on their voting preferences. Using a sample of 1,025 uh, persons, the study concluded that 45% of Albertans are in favor of the NDP and 41% are in favor of the UCP. All right, we can take what we learned in the previous illustration and apply it here. So our starting point would be identify the population and identify the sample. Okay, so we have our population. I'm gonna use the short notation for population. And in this case, it would be all eligible Albertans. And when I say eligible, I mean voting eligible. So Albertans that can vote. All right. The sample is going to be the 1,025 Albertans surveyed. Okay. Inferential or descriptive. So the key to determining whether or not a study is inferential or descriptive lies in where the statement is being made or what the statement is being made about. In the description of the problem, it says using a sample of 1,025 Albertans, um, the survey concluded that 45% of all Albertans are in favor of the NDP and 41% are in favor of the UCP. So this particular example is highlighting that the survey is using the, the sample to make a statement about the population. So we are using the 1,025 persons in the sample to make a statement about all Albertans, right? So we can highlight here, the study concluded that 45% of Albertans, okay? And this is the key. So because we are concluding that 45% of all Albertans based off of our sample are in favor of NDP, we can label this as an inferential study. Oh. Since the sample 
is being used to make a statement about all Albertans, okay? So inferential studies are ones where we take a sample and then we use the sample to make a statement about the population. In the second illustration or the second example, I have suppose I collected a random sample of 25 students from this particular um, class of students. And from the 25 students, I recorded their shoe size. I then report the average shoe size of the sample to the class. All right, so the starting point is the same. We can identify the population would be all students in this class. And then the sample will be um, the 25 collected students, All right? Now, is this descriptive or inferential? We can see that based off of the example, I am reporting the average shoe size of the sample. So I am simply taking the shoe sizes that I collected from the 25 students, finding the average value and just stating the average value of those 25 students. I am not using the sample to make a statement about the population. I am simply describing the sample that I have collected. Therefore, it is descriptive. Okay, so report the average shoe size of that sample. Okay. So that's the key. So this is descriptive since I am only um, giving the average of the sample. Okay, so descriptive statistical studies are one where we can still collect a sample from a population, but we do not try and use the sample values to make a statement about the population. We simply report what we found for the, for the sample that we collected. <clears throat> so we can describe a particular study as being inferential or being descriptive, depending on the goal of the study. We can also describe a statistical study as being an observational study or a designed experiment. The differences between, or the main difference between an observational study and a designed experiment is the, um, is how the result of interest is generated. In an observational study, we're not actually performing a task or running any type of experiment to elicit a result. The result of interest is naturally going to occur within the environment that we are studying. In the designed experiment, we actually apply a pressure to the elements that we are studying to elicit the response. So in designed experiments, we are manufacturing an outcome by applying some kind of treatment or um, pressure to the elements that we are studying, right? Another way we can think about this, in the observational study, the data or the results of interest are going to exist regardless of whether or not we are present. In the designed experiment, the data or the results don't exist until we actually run the experiment. Observational studies can reveal association design experiments can establish causation. Now, determining whether or not we are dealing with an observational study or a designed experiment is again, or it can be done simply by reading a, a short description of the, the study that we are interested in. 
For example, in, in the first illustration here, I have in Dean et al. 2021. So this is a paper that appeared in PeerJ last year. Individual zebrafish were placed into dosing containers whose volume was either zero or 1% ethanol to study anxiety. All right, so is this a observational study or a designed experiment? Well, this has to be a designed experiment because the zebrafish are not going to be exposed to the ethanol unless we actually put them into the dosing container. So we are studying how anxious the zebrafish are by placing them into different um, concentrations of ethanol. So this is a designed experiment since we have to expose the zebrafish to different concentrations of ethanol. In the second illustration, I have uh, Dr. Jane Goodall spent three decades observing chimpanzees in their natural environment in East Africa. She examined such things as their social structure, mating patterns, gender roles, family structure, and how they care for their offspring by observing them in the wild. So this is a fairly <laughs> obvious example in that observing has been used on two different occasions. But the idea here is simply that Dr. Goodall went into the natural habitat of the chimpanzees and she watched and observed how they behave. She didn't apply a pressure. She didn't expose the chimpanzees to any sort of treatment or um, um, drug, for example. She simply studied how they relate to one another within their natural environment. So that makes this an observational study. Okay. The chim and disease within their natural habitat without applying any um, pressure. Okay, so, so far we've talked about the idea of population versus sample. The sample is a collection of elements from the population that we are studying. We then discussed the difference between descriptive and inferential tools. We use descriptive tools to compute values or graphs from the sample and describe what we have seen from that sample directly, whereas inferential tools are ones where we use the sample to make a statement about the population. We can also define our sample based off how the data is produced. In the case of a designed experiment, we actually um, produce or kind of force the results by applying a pressure, such as um, dosing zebrafish with different levels of ethanol. In an observational study, the data exists regardless of whether or not we intervene. Now, descriptive and inferential tools, while they are different in their overall goal, they are intrinsically intertwined. We cannot actually perform inferential statistics without the descriptive tools. So we need the results from our descriptive studies in order to take it to the next level and use them within an inferential study. In general, you will be... Um, let's say, exposed to different inferential results throughout your daily life, one of the biggest things or one of the best questions that you can ask is where did the sample come from? Is the sample representative? We talked about this idea very loosely before, but 
are they using an appropriate collection of elements to make a statement about the larger population that is of interest to us? All right. Now, the last um, topic in this set is that of actually collecting the sample. In general, it'll be very rare that we can um, study the entire population that's of interest. Most often we will have to collect a portion of the population um, for our particular study. Now there's a lot of different reasons why this would be the case. Those reasons could be time related or financially related. Um, it could just be that collecting information from every single population is not possible because they might not respond to your question or you are not gonna be able to get everyone in the case that you're studying people in the same place at the same time, right? Um, so sampling is our best strategy for actually taking information from the population of interest and then being able to make statements about that population. So the question is, how do we sample? Well, we know that the most, or the one of the most important things is that our sample represents the population of interest. For example, if I wanted to um, study the statistical abilities of all students at McEwen University, but my sample was just my second year class of 30 students, this would not be a representative sample because I am taking students that have a statistical background and are currently studying statistics at the second year level. And I'm using those students to make a statement about every single student at the school, regardless of their background. So this would be a misleading sample because it would most likely indicate that the overall statistical ability of all students at the university is much higher than it actually is. Okay, now how do we actually collect a, a representative sample? Well, to do this, we have to have a list of all the population elements that is required. Um, but what we can do is employ a probability-based technique. Now, this isn't as intimidating as it sounds. It basically just means that given a list of all population elements, we randomly select from that population some number of um, elements to fill our sample. And there's a lot of different ways of randomly selecting. Um, for example, we can use random number generators. Um, we can use more uh, sort of hands-on basic techniques, which I'll talk about momentarily. Um, or we could use things like random number tables, which we're not going to see in this course because they're kind of outdated now. But we will see these random number generators in our uh, statistical labs. The most basic probability sampling scheme is called simple random sampling. There are two types of simple random sampling strategies. There's simple random sampling without replacement and there's simple random sampling with replacement. I'm gonna show you an illustration of the differences between the two just for clarity, but most often we will focus on simple random sampling without replacement. And the idea here is simply that every single element within the population has an equal chance of being chosen for the sample, but they can only appear one time. This also means that every single sample that we could collect, because if every one of us collected our own simple random sample, they're gonna contain different values. All of those different samples have the same probability of being collected. Okay. So, how does, or what would a simple random sampling result look like? So let's consider a very naive illustration. Suppose that we have four elements within our population. So these are gonna be four types of SUVs in this, in this case. So a BMW SUV, a Mercedes SUV, a Volkswagen SUV, and a Porsche SUV. Okay, so we have four elements within the population. How many different samples of size two are possible if we utilize simple random sampling without replacement? So all we're going to do here is list out all the different simple random samples that we could observe if we applied this technique to our four SUVs. All right, so 
the first sample is going to be the BMW and the Mercedes. The second sample is going to be the BMW and the Volkswagen. The third sample is going to be the BMW and the Porsche. So you can see here, all I'm doing is enumerating all the different collections of two elements that I can take from the four elements. And all of these are possible simple random samples. And you'll see that in this particular case, whether I take the BMW first or the Mercedes first doesn't matter. So I have listed BMW first, but a sample composed of BMW and then Mercedes is the same as the sample of Mercedes and then BMW. Okay, okay so what other samples can I observe here? Well, I could also see the sample of a Mercedes and a Volkswagen, a Mercedes and a Porsche, and then I could see the Volkswagen and the Porsche, right? So the answer to this particular problem, there are six possible, possible, possible SRS of size two. Okay. How many samples of size two are possible if simple random sampling with replacement is utilized? The only difference here is that a sample can now contain the same element twice. So we would have all of the same results that we had written above for simple random sampling without replacement. So all of these samples are still possible. But in addition, we would have four other samples that are comprised of the same SUV um, on uh, the same SUV twice, right? So we would also have BMW, BMW. We would have Mercedes, Mercedes. We would have Volkswagen, Volkswagen. And we would have Porsche, Porsche. Okay. So in this case, we have 10 possible SRSWR of size two. Right. So the only difference between a simple random sample and a simple random sample with replacement is that a simple random sample with replacement will pick something out of the population, record whatever it is we're interested in, throw it back into the population, and then you could pick it again. With a simple random sample, you would pick something out of the population, record whatever it is you're interested in, and then you would pick another thing out and not put that first unit back in. Right. How can we collect simple random samples? All right. I alluded to this um, on slide 16. There's a lot of different ways to do this, but the key is that every single population element has the same chance of being observed within the population. All right, so for example, let's assume that there are 721 different strains of marijuana, right? So experts suggest that there's over 700. I don't actually know how many there are, but let's say there's 721 for illustrative purposes. How can we collect a simple random sample of size 10 from the population? All right, there's a number of different ways that we could do this. Let's start with a very simple illustration of how we could do this just to try and um, solidify the idea of simple random sampling. Okay, so what we could do is step one, order all alphabetically. Okay, so we're going to order all the strains by the, the name of the strain. So alphabetical order. Step two, assign each strain a number from one to 
721. Okay. So now what we're going to do is take our list of strains. So you can imagine that the strains are listed alphabetically. And then beside each strain, we're going to give it a number. So the, the strain that's listed first, so like strain A, is going to be assigned the number one. Strain A, B is going to be assigned the number two. Strain B is going to be assigned the number three, et cetera, all the way down to 721. Okay, then what we can do is um, take 721, uh, let's say Q cards, and write the number on each Q card. Okay, so we're going to have a cue card with the number one on it, a cue card with the number two on it, a cue card with the number three on it, a cue card with the number four on it, etc. All right, then what we're going to do is place these 721 cue cards into a box shake up the box, select 10 cards, okay? So we have our 721 cue cards. Each cue card has a number on it, one, two, three, four, all the way up to 721. We've put them into a box. We've shaken the box sufficiently as if to randomly assort the cue cards within the box. And then we've reached in and we pulled out 10 cards. Then what we're going to do is flip over the cards, write down the 10 numbers, and then go back to our list and take those 10 strains. So step five, flip over cards, match number to strain type. Sample those 10 strings, okay? And that would be a um, very painful way of collecting a simple random sample of size 10 from a population with 721 elements in it. But hopefully this illustration helps to solidify this idea of randomness and equal probability being assigned to each value within the population. Well, e equal selection probability being assigned to each value within the population. Right. So in the first lecture set, we've just talked about some general definitions um, of statistical tools, types of experiments. We strictly define this idea of population versus sample and how we could collect a sample from that population. Throughout the course, our main focus will be collecting a sample and then using it to make a statement about the population. On the journey to learning how to do this, so on the path to developing our inferential approaches, we will talk about descriptive tools. That's the focus of lecture set number two. And then we will do some fundamental background development in um, calculating and interpreting probabilities. And we will define um, common statistical distributions that we will utilize in our inferential studies. So there's quite a bit of background that we have to develop before we get to our goal of learning how to conduct inference. But um, all of the things that we will study along the way are required for us to get to this um, discussion and um, um, study in the second half of the course. All right, so a few other closing remarks here. Um, I have typically we will be interested in measuring some response using the observations in a sample. We're going to talk more about this idea of um, variable type and response in lecture set number two. 
But usually when we collect our sample, it's with the intention of measuring a specific value or multiple values for the population of interest. Um, and we will be able to describe these the, the responses that we're interested in studying using another set of statistical terminology, which is basically just that we will learn how to, or we will learn about different types of data and different types of variables at the start of lecture set number two. Okay, so that's our walkthrough of lecture set number one. At the end of the lecture set, I have a cumulative exercise, which is for you to try on your own. And I will post the solution to this exercise with the completed lecture notes at the end of each week. Okay, so this will be posted on Friday. All right, um, have a good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, depending on when you watch the video. And I will see you in class on Tuesday or Thursday morning, depending on your uh, particular section.